functions. So the open top box problem, we worked on all day Monday. You had homework on it. Okay. So this is a context for what's called input-output relationships. Okay, for example. Uh, input as the uh, length of the square cutout. So side length of the square cutout. An output. So what was an output? So we, we had that square cutout. What's an example of a possible output? Another quantity that we looked at. Yeah, so the volume of the resulting box, right? Okay, so that's an idea of input and output. So we get this input quantity of uh, how how uh, how big you cut the square in terms of the side length. Okay, so what the side length of your square is, and then that will give you a resulting volume of the box. That's like output. Okay. So some input-output relationships are functions. Some are not. And so we want to kind of hone in on these, these, these very special input-output relationships that are functions. Okay? So there are special input-output relationships that are functions. So we have to know what what uh, makes an input-output relationship a function. Okay, does it make sense so far? So that's that. This is our kind of our. Uh, what we're going to talk about this week um, coming up to your exam. Okay, so your exam is what? A week from tomorrow. First exam, a week from tomorrow. Okay, so what makes an input output relationship a function? So here, this is the whole name of the game here. So let's, let's take an example of an input output relationship, and that is um, making a call with your phone. Okay, making a call with your phone. What's the input? Yeah, so you're going to put a phone number, right? So an input is a phone number. That's what you input into your phone, right? Okay, so here's some examples, okay? Please don't call these numbers. I just made them up. Don't get me in trouble, okay? Just, they're just examples, all right? Don't call these numbers. All right, so what's the output? So the input is you call a number. What's the output of your, kind of your phone and your service? Okay, so yeah, she said whoever picks up the phone. So when you call a number, you want to get a person or a place, right? That's the output, okay? So you want to reach a phone somewhere else. You're trying to reach a phone somewhere else, okay? So for you all, what are these things like? Your mom, your friend, pizza delivery, visa customer service, your brother, your ex, okay? So these are all possible outputs of this relationship, okay? You got input and you got output, okay? So here's the deal. So we're talking about functions. And so the, the name function is chosen. It's chosen purposefully. How does your phone and service function properly? How does it all work according to the way you want it to work? Okay, here's how it works. Every time you dial this number, what? You always want to get that recipient, right? Every time. So every time you call, 745063. You want to get Visa customer service. And every time you call this number, you want to get your friend. Okay? 
That's a working phone, right? It's a functional phone. Functional. Okay. Similarly, so every so when you dial a number, you want to know that you're going to be connected with the right person, right? Okay. So this is this is the this is the criteria for a function. <coughs> We're saying what makes an input output relationship a function. For each input, what? Function has one unique output. For each input, you get one unique output. Okay, so what about this? What if you, when you dial this number, sometimes you get pizza delivery, but sometimes you get your mom. And when you dial this number, <laughs> You intend to get your brother, but sometimes you get your ex. We're back. What's that? You like it? You're going to keep using it? No, right? You're going to get a new phone. You're going to get a new service. Okay? You're going to get a new phone. Why? Because it's not performing its function. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. Why? Because the same input is giving, what, multiple outputs. So it's not performing a valid function, you see? So for a valid function, when you have an input, you want to get one unique output. And so then there's purpose to it. There's purpose to it. This is chaos, right? This is chaos. OK, so now how about this? So here, here's where, it get, here's where you, we have to really uh, think about it. What if your friend has two numbers? So your friend has a cell phone, and yeah, maybe you have a phone in the room, OK? So when you call this number, you get your friend. When you call this number, you get your friend. Same with Visa customer service. Maybe both these numbers, and that's, this is, these are both very realistic situations, right? So is this, is, does this, what I've shown you here, is this an input-output relationship that's a valid function? Yes or no? Yes. So if you're not sure, you go back to the definition, and you hold it up against the definition. For each input, do you get one unique output? Is it okay? No. Yeah, it's, it's okay. All right, so it's still a working phone. It's still, when you call this number, you get one person. When you call this number, you get one person, always. Now, it's the same person for both numbers, but that's okay, because the definition is, for an input, you get a unique output. All right, so this is still a function. All right, the phone is functioning fine. It's functioning fine, even though more than one number is giving the same output. That's not what we need. That's not the criteria. The criteria is for every input, you get one output. Okay. Anybody have a question? Does it make sense? Yeah. So if they all call the same. So if every single so, and this is very like, like, like say uh, these are customer service. So like these these big credit card companies have lots of different ways to get to their switchboard, right? So what if every single one of these numbers resulted in reaching Visa customer service. Would it be a function still? Yeah. Why? Because, it, again, the, the check is, the, the, the test that you put it through is, if every time you choose an input, if you just get one unique output, then it's a function, and that would be true. OK, another example. All right, so suppose one summer you and a friend visit a lake, and several evenings you take data regarding temperature, frogs, and crickets. At the end of the summer, you organize your data into the following graphs. So here's your frog's graph. So you're counting how many times you hear a ribbit in one minute on several occasions, right? You're counting how many ribbits per minute, and then you recorded what the temperature was when you heard that number of ribbits per minute. Okay? So what's the input? Well, the input is number of ribbits that you hear. Okay, number of ribbits that you hear. So what are some possible values of input here? Two. Three. Yeah, so two, three, four, and five, right? Okay, this is called, uh, we'll talk about this later, but this is called the domain. All possible input values is called the domain of the function. So this set right here, two, three, four, and five, is our domain, okay? When you input two, and so what does the output represent? What quantity is the output? Temperature, right? And when you input two ribbits, what temperature do you get for an output? 
looks like 79 to me, right? You see that? That point represents two rivets in a minute. There was a time we counted two rivets and it was 79 degrees out. All right, when we counted three rivets, what was the output? Let me ask you this, how many outputs were there? Two different times we counted three rivets, so we got different temperatures, right? So maybe, I don't know, what is that, 68 and, I'm just guessing here, just pulling them off, and 91, is that reasonable? Okay, four rivets. Three inputs, 58. Uh, 63, I'm just guessing, and 82. And then for five, similar, there's three inputs, three outputs. Okay? Is it a function? No. No, right? Because for an input, we're getting more than one output for a given input. Okay, you also counted crickets. You also counted crickets. Okay, so what's the possible input value here? 92. What was the output? 92 chirps in a minute. 58. We'll just do a couple here. 96 was another input, number of chirps that you heard on one night. What's that? 79. And then say uh, 99. 90. 90. Function? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so why do we have this rule? Why do we have this rule that there has to be, and you've probably heard this in pre-calculus before, but did you ever think about why do we care? Why, so why do we specify that a function has to be that when you have for every input, you have exactly one output? Why do we care? Why is that the rule? Just so you could do some math exercises? No. Because What's the point? If, a, if we get an output, we get two outputs for one input, then our data is inconsistent. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's about consistency, it's about predictability and reliability, right? So what are you going to listen to to predict the temperature? Crickets or frogs? Crickets, right? So there's, there's a, there's a this has, the listening to crickets has a function. It'll tell you the temperature. Listening to rivets doesn't have any function. You see? It doesn't have any thing that it does that helps us. Okay, so one unique output for each input means that a function is performing a reliable function. It's doing something. So it's aptly named, right? It's aptly named a function because it has something that it does. Okay, we'll do that later. Okay, so... Uh, Talk about this. So we need notation. We need notation for functions. Ways of representing them. So it's this idea of a process of input and output. So hope, so those in Monday recitation, hopefully you went over this. Those in today's recitation, hopefully you got my email and you watched the five minutes of the end of the video. But this is definitely worth repeating. So let's talk about um, this length of the side of the cutout and volume as the output. So, so you can also think about a function as like a machine that's doing a process, right? So the length of the side of the cutout is your input, volume is the output. So is it a valid function? Is it a function or not? And if you're not sure, what do you ask yourself?
Yeah, so for every cutout, if I make a cutout, if I choose 1.2 inches as my cutout square, do I get one box volume or could I get more than one? Only get one. Only get one volume, right? So for each square that you cut, you're going to fold that box up. There's only one volume that will result. Okay? So input and output. Uh, that's not the right. This button. So the parts of a function are the input and the output and the rule that determines the output given the input. So there's a rule. So when our input is a quantity and our output is a quantity, how do we get that output quantity given the input quantity? Well, there's a rule that determines it. OK? So here, this is our notation. So we said the output was the volume. Okay, this f, you've seen this before, probably in pre-calculus, this f, it could be a g or an h or a p, it doesn't have to be f, but that, what's that? That's called the name of the function. That's the name of the function. Okay. The input was our uh, length of the side cutout. You see that both here and in the rule. Right? So you see it, this is what we call function notation, right here, function notation. So you see the input in the function notation, you also see it as the rule, because the rule is something that crunches on that input. Okay, and then that whole, that whole thing is the rule. Okay, so you got the name, you got the input, Okay, so you may be tempted to say, oh, I've done these before. You just plug in numbers and crank out, and so I'll just, I'll just tune out right now and wait for the punchline. You know, this, this is what we're going to focus on is representation and understanding the symbols rather than just cranking out a bunch of numbers, okay? So and you kind of saw that in the homework that was due today, that we're really going to focus on what do things mean. So it's like, it's like we're learning a language. We're learning a language of functions, okay? So you got the name, the input, the rule, and the output. Those are the four pieces of a function, the four parts. Name, input, output, and rule. So this right here, that whole thing that I put inside the blue box, this is what we have to acclimate ourselves to and really understand what that is. So of the four things, rule, input, name, output, what is represented by what I have in the blue box of the four things? Is it the rule? Is it the input? Is it the name or the output? The output. I hear most people saying the output, and that's right. Okay, so if I write... When I write that whole thing, what did I write? Did I write a... Side length of the box, or did I write a volume? Did I write the side length of the box or the volume? <coughs> that whole thing is what? It's output, and what was our output quantity? Volume. So this, when you look at this in the context of the box problem, you say, oh, that's a volume. Okay. Which volume is it? Is the volume equal to 2? No. No. What volume is it? Okay, but what's so what's x? So this is the volume of a box when? <coughs> when x equals two, when the input is two. That's true, when the input is two, but let's talk about it in terms of the box. So somebody else, this is the volume of the box when what? Yeah. Right. And when the side length of the cutout is two. So that's what we want to practice. So not only do we want to, like, when we see it, recognize it, but then when we're in, the, when we're in a problem, we want to be able to, like, call on that and be able to, to write that representation rather than having to have a number, right? So, so it, um, I think for some students it feels uncomfortable that we didn't actually calculate a volume that's this many cubic inches. 
but this is perfectly legitimate as a representation of a volume, a specific volume, right? The volume when the cutout side length is 2. Okay? Tell the person next to you, what, what does that mean? So what did I just write? So, so we say f of b. That's, what, that's what, how we say it. Tell the person next to you what it represents. f of b. Where's Angelina? Angelina, did you get it? Tell me. She wants. To, she says the volume of the box from the side length cutout is B. Agree? Cool. All right. So now a couple more to practice here. How about this? So explain both of those expressions. What's that mean? So these are different. How are they? So what does each one mean? And so what's the distinction between the two? Go. What are those? Okay, where's Jackie? Where's Jackie? How'd it go? Tell me about this is the first one. Tell me about the So what does that so what does that whole thing mean in terms of the box and side length and all that stuff? <laughs> so but what is it? So that, that's what we're getting at. What does it mean? This expression right here, what does it mean? So, so that's a, this is something you've learned in the past, what you were saying you've learned in the past. And I'm, now we want to really understand what does that say or what does it mean? Where is uh, Kirk? Where's Kirk? Kirk Mitchell. Yeah. First one. Yeah, the first one. He wants the volume of the box when the side length of the cutout is 3 plus h. That's it. OK? How about, where is Ryan, Lenise? Ryan, tell me about the second one. So tell me what it is, and then tell me how it's different. OK, so obviously you have these things that, but um, it would be the volume when the side length is 3, but also to get that volume, you would need to add whatever it is. So this, just this is, you said the volume when the side cutout is 3. All right. So then, what is what would this plus h represent? How about so? Is this h? Is it implied that this h is a side cutout length or a, a volume? Yeah, if we're adding it to this is a volume, right? And now we're adding it to h. Then that. For, in order for this to be valid, H would have to be what kind of quantity? Volume, right? So it's like we, we had the volume for a side cutout length of 3, and then we increased that volume by H, you see? We had the volume for a side cutout length of, th of 3, that's that, and we increased it by H. What does H represent in this one? It's an increase, but an increase of what? Side length. You say, had your 3 side length, then you increased the side length, and then you found the volume. You see? It's different. So we had our, we were at three. We increased by h, and then we, then we got the volume of that box. Here we got the volume of the box at three, 
and then increase the volume by h. Does it make sense? So this, this is the kind of thing we're going to practice a lot of. If you think it's easy, I'm really glad. But, but I think a lot of us have never really worked at that before, and it's really important. <laughs> OK. So let's talk about, uh, let's practice while I take roll. So if you go to, oh, actually, I want to, so I want to, I want to talk about domain. So uh, what do we say domain was? All possible, what, inputs or outputs? Inputs, okay, domain is all possible inputs. So let's just review that again for this, the box problem. So, so same, the same function that we just had, f of x, What is f of x? If it's the same function that we just have, what does f of x represent? Volume. volume of the box with cut out side length of x. Okay. So if we're talking about all possible inputs, are we talking about all possible volumes or all possible side lengths? All possible side lengths. All possible inputs is the domain. All possible inputs to the domain. So now we want to ask ourselves, what are all possible inputs in this situation? So we did this on Monday. What's the lowest possible? So to get all possible, we like look at a range of inputs, right? So we're looking at the lowest and the highest. What was our lowest possible value of side length? Zero. And were we okay with that? Did we come to a place where we were... You know, in our Zen place, and we were okay that, that x could be zero mathematically, right? Just means you don't cut out squares. It's perfectly possible. So mathematically, x can be zero. It's okay. You just get a flat piece of paper and no and what's your volume? Zero, right? So it's it's a real world situation. It's a value that x can take on. It's okay. Alright, and so then we said We're going to increase x, and so when can we? When is it no longer physically possible to cut a square side length? What's the longest one we can do? 4.25. Right. And what about 4.25? Is it okay? So that's the limiting value. Is it possible to have squares of side length 4.25? Yes. You end up with this situation where you just have this flap, and you fold it, and then. Again, what's v? Zero. Okay, but mathematically, as a as a possible value of x where we can actually cut squares out, it's possible. What about cutting squares of five? Can we do it? No. Can't do it because once we cut out five, say out of this corner, I'm going to cut five like this, right? Five. There's no way I can get a valid cut of a square of five by five over here. Once I cut past that middle line. I can't get my square of 5 by 5. So that's greater than 4.25 is impossible. Okay? So this would be the domain of the function. You can write it as interval, uh, inequality notation or interval notation. Interval notation will look like this. And remember, if you don't want to include an endpoint, use parentheses instead. So if it were that we didn't want to include 0, then on that left side we'd put parentheses. But we do want to include 0 here. Okay, look at the top of page 83. So if we want to determine if an input-output relationship is a function, and if we want to figure out what the domain is, the first thing we got to know what we have to be good at is just in a situation identifying what's the input and what's the output. So there's different language that can do that. So where are we? There it is. That's what I want. All right. So, so you, you come to a situation, and it says p is a function of s. or so, so one quantity is a function of another quantity. All right? That means that s is the input, and p is your output. 
So we, we'll never get off the ground if we don't correctly identify the input and output in a given situation. So when it says p is a function of x, s, we're saying p is the output, a function order dependent on the input s. Okay? Similarly, if we say p in terms of s, that's kind of more thinking about the rule, right? So in terms of s means our rule is full of what? P's or s's? s's. Full of s's in terms of s. So the rule has s's in it, therefore s is the input, and p is dependent on it, or in terms of s, and p is the output. Another thing we could say is p with respect to s. Same thing. That means that s is the input, and p is the output. So before we can make any correct conclusions about whether something is a function or what its domain is or what the rule is, we got to know for sure that this quantity is the input and this quantity is the output. So here's the, here's the different language that you'll see to determine that. Now, you might say, oh, okay, well, so it means that always the second one's the input and the first one's the output. Well, things can be reworded, so you still have to think about it. But if, um, if it uses these three phrases, that is true, but... You know, they can just tell you what the input is first and then give you the output after. That's, that's valid, too, if they don't use one of those phrases. So still read it every time. Okay, so what I want you to work on is, on, starting there on page 83, numbers 2 through 6. 2 through 6. And I also want you to add one more question on every one. What is the domain of the function? Okay, so you're, uh, and this is um, this is good for discussion, but keep it low enough that I can take the roll. So two through six, pages eighty-three through eighty-five, and then for each one, do a, a, an extra part where you ask, "What is the domain of the function?" Okay. Okay, first one. Percentage grade on a test in terms of letter grade earned. What's the input? Letter grade. Letter grade is the input. Okay. What is the output? Percentage. Is it a function? Yes or no? So a letter grade of B. Does it, does it mean exactly one percentage? Lots of percentages, right? Not a function. Okay, what would the, what would the domain of this function be? So what are all possible inputs? Yeah, all letter grades. A, B, C, D, E, F, E, or A plus, A, A minus, B plus, whatever the, whatever the scale is, right? Be all the letter grades. That'd be the domain. I'm just doing Cool. Remind me. OK, uh, consider the letter grade. All right, what about the other way around? Letter grade in terms of percentage. Input. Percentage. Output. Letter grade. Is it a function? Yes, because each percentage has only one letter grade. Right, right, exactly. So 81% uh, is B, okay? So it is a function. All right, um, was there anyone yet? So I'm not going to go through all these, but this is practice to really acclimate ourselves with what's the input, what's the output, is it a function, what's the domain? Is there a request? Is there one you want to talk about? Request? Here's your chance. Someone wants to ask a question about one. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, so here's an example. So this kind of ties it all together. You're driving from Chicago to Kansas City. 4.5 hours after you leave Chicago, you reach St. Louis. 7 hours and 45 minutes after leaving Chicago, you reach Kansas City. Okay? Create a function named g that gives the distance driven since leaving Chicago in miles, call that d, with respect to the time and minutes elapsed after leaving St. Louis. Notice, after leaving St. Louis. Okay? So it's your, your distance in miles from Chicago, or distance traveled from Chicago, 
with respect to time and minutes elapsed after leaving St. Louis T. So here's your task for the next couple minutes. So even without the rule, so we don't have a rule for this function, but we can still set up function notation. So write the function notation according to how I've explained the situation here. So write the function notation. Find the domain. Okay. This is going to take a little bit of thought. Don't just rush through B. You've got to think about this because you really have to understand what those two quantities are, D and T. And then uh, interpret what all those quantities, what all those symbols represent. Okay, go. So if there's a, you could do this in your notes or see any blank space around. There's some space at the bottom of page 90 if you don't if you don't have a notebook. So you could do a note in your notes or bottom of page 90. So again, what do we mean by function notation? That's like, for example, g of x. Or, no, it's not like that. Well, that's a really good example, right? So um, uh, like f of x or h of y. This is what we, whenever you see the, this function notation, it's talking about this notation right here. Z of, I don't know, okay. That's what we mean by function notation.
Where's Brenda Vargas? Brenda? Yeah, how'd the function notation go? You set up the function? So you want g of something? G of, so that's the question is g of what? And so and how do we represent that? Is it x? Is x the minutes elapsed? What is it? G of t. So you could write this. That's valid. Or you could, how could you get d involved? G of d? Could you do g of d? D equals, right? Because G of T, that represents the output, which is distance traveled from Chicago. So you could you could also write this if you wanted. But this is enough, right? Either way. So you could write G of T or well, we know what G of T is. That's the output. And our output is distance driven since leaving Chicago. Okay, so what's the domain? Does it, is the domain about possible distance distances or times? Uh, Tell me. Zero to what? One ninety five. And how'd you get that? Um, uh, Including zero? Is this what you said? That's what I heard. Is that right? I mean, the zero, uh, I mean, uh, yes, yeah. Okay. You like it? Is this what you got? How did you get that? Do you know, does it make sense? So what's the lowest possible value of t? Is it four point? Is it four point nine hours in minutes? No, because it's it's time elapsed after leaving St. Louis, right? So what's the lowest possible value we could have for that? Zero. Now in this situation, what's the highest possible value of minutes elapsed? Not infinity, right? Well, yeah. So yeah, you could you could argue. Um, you could argue that it all the way to infinity, so you could just time keeps going even after you reach Kansas City, or you could argue that the domain ends when you reach Kansas City, which is how many minutes after St. Louis? Is it three hours and twenty-five minutes? Yeah, so it so it takes three hours. Sorry, in fifteen minutes, right? Three fifteen. And so that would be one ninety-five. This is 195 minutes. Okay, so depending on your interpretation of the question, either of these are okay. T starts at zero, and you could say that the, the highest value for the domain would be when you reach St. Louis, or you could just say time just keeps going. Okay? So we will pick up, so uh, this is what we'll pick up on Friday. This is really important, this stuff, that you can interpret those.